We'll be there till the rapture. I got a spot in my eye. I looked out the door on the way in and the sun was reflecting off a car windshield. So, <clears throat> there is, as always, I mean, there's always a lot going on. It depends on where you want to look and what you want to look at. But uh, we went over Thursday night about some things that are happening uh so right now they've they've got the um, the COP meeting, Conference of Parties. This is their 28th meeting. They started in 1995. And we went through some interesting aspects of uh, the gentleman that's running that, that conference this year, and it's King Charles. Um, I, I don't spend a lot of time dealing with, you know, the royal monarchy and all that nonsense. I don't really care. Uh, but when you start to see how it plugs into everything we're talking about here and how it plugs into what we have been talking about for a long time, uh, it, it does make things quite a bit more interesting. And I, I had a chance, I want to do some more digging, but I had a chance to do a little bit more research um, Friday, which continues to, to build this thing. But I, I still don't know how to place all of this. I mean, and I don't know that I'm going to figure figure it all out. But I, I continue to re read Esther and read over it, especially the first couple of chapters, because that's what we're dealing with right now. Just trying to figure out who the characters represent specifically and, and how the things go. And I just keep mulling over it. And last night, <laughs> I was looking at it all again. And it was probably... Um, somewhere around 9 or 10 o'clock last night, and then something hit me. And I don't know if this is going to play out, so you're kind of getting some some of this raw a little bit because uh, I don't know if it ties in, but you start looking at some of these some of these interesting aspects. So what we looked at just briefly with King Charles is the fact that uh, a lot of the things he's been doing over the last year, they tie in with a lot of Bible prophecy. Now, I mentioned this, and I still don't think that he's the Antichrist. There's a lot out there right now that people are saying that he's he's the Antichrist. There are some things that he's doing that definitely definitely make that look uh, pretty, you could definitely see that. One of those things is the fact that uh, on, on uh, March 21st of this year, he went to Israel, and I, I didn't even bring the article, I should have brought it this morning, but he went to Israel. He's the first person out of the British royal monarchy that has done a political visit to Israel. They've had others go and just be there, but they have not actually gone for political purposes. He's the first one. And he went, and on March 21st of this year, he agreed to a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel. It's not enacted yet. I'll get to that in a minute. It's not enacted yet, but he, he agreed to a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel to help protect them and to help lead them. Uh, so that is a very interesting aspect. Then, a little over a month later, on May 6th, he was coronated as king of the royal monarchy. Now, interesting about that day, it's May 6th of 2023, five Six and if you add two plus two plus three, that's seven. Five, six, seven. Those numbers equal thirteen. And we've mentioned before, from the date of his mother's funeral till his coronation was six weeks, six months, six days. Six, six, six. So there's a lot of interesting things that are going on now in this conference of parties. It's happening right now. It's been from November 30th, and it culminates Tuesday the 12th. He is he he's the leading person running this this conference this year. He opened the conference and he's closing the conference. It's the first time that he's ever done that. Now he's participated in a few others prior, but not not as the opener and the closer. And the word on the street is is that on December 12th, which is Tuesday, he's going to give his final speech and in that he is going to enact the agreement 
that he made with Israel back in March of this year. That's going to be the day that actually that agreement, that seven-year covenant, goes into effect. Which would tie in with Daniel 9.27 that says that the Antichrist will, will make an agreement for one week, which is seven years. So there are some things that you look at and go, wow, it, it, it does look pretty interesting. Here's another thing that I didn't know until Friday. Over there in Revelation chapter 17, verse 11, it says the Antichrist will come out of the seven. He'll be the eighth. I don't know if you guys remember that verse. There have been seven King Charles in the British royal monarchy. King, uh, King Charles, the current King Charles III is the eighth. So that was that was kind of an interesting concept. I listened to the same guy that was giving me this information that I presented Thursday, which I didn't even get through all of it, but he put out a a deal that I think there's like 30 some uh, aspects of King Charles' life and what he's doing right now, and then they brought scripture to each one of them. Now some of them, some of them were dead on. Like, yeah, you can't. You can't deny that. Some of them, you're like, yeah, maybe I can see that. But still, you get up to, you're getting into the 30s. There's a lot of things that are happening that tie in with, with his life and what's going on. And I want to I wanna hit on a few things this morning before we get into the meat of it. But uh, So, as I mentioned, Esther chapter 1 specifically, I mean, there's just dozens of things going on. And I, I'm just trying to... Basically, for all of our sakes, I'm just trying to help bring it in to how it applies to you and I right now and how we can know what God's trying to do through through what he's done in Esther's life and uh, how it ties in with what we're doing uh, right now. And laid out last week a couple different scenarios that could, could potentially be taking place. Ahasuerus potentially could be a picture of God the Father, but he could also be... Uh, you know, different things. So I, I, I'll just be honest with you. I have no idea. I look at it, trying to look at it from each way. How does, how, okay, if he's God the Father, does this pertain? But there's some things I'm like, I, I just can't see it trying to make him be God in this particular scenario and, and vice versa. But, but as we look at uh, what is happening in Esther, because we do know that it pictures the rapture of the church, or at least God moving away from the Gentiles and bringing the nation of Israel back into favor. Well, if what is going to happen Tuesday truly happens, or what they say is going to happen truly happens Tuesday, to me that is God, not God himself, but through the events of the world, bringing Israel back into favor to some degree. Now, you've got to understand this, and a lot of people get this confused. Especially when you talk about, you know, the nation of Israel coming back into favor and how God's bringing Israel back and all these things. you got to understand that the people that are there now, the, the government, the political leaders, the religious leaders, I don't think a lot of them are, are the ones God is, is working through. They're just figureheads. Well, it's, it's kind of like leadership around any other nation around the world right now. They're just figureheads. The real group that God's going to work through are the, the, the individuals you know, based around the 144,000 and then the ones that, that come around with them and, and want to seek truth through them. It's not going to, it was not the Jewish government at the first advent that wanted to accept Jesus Christ. It wanted to have anything to do with Christ. It was it was the lowly disciples. It was the lowly men and women who were plagued with diseases and with problems and with ailments. Those were the ones that sought Jesus Christ, not the leadership. It's the same true today. The leadership that's there now is not the one that the ones that God is looking at and saying, "Oh, these are my people. These are the ones I'm going to uh, you know, spare through the tribulation and such. No, it has nothing to do with them. He's, it's a nation for him. He's working through a nation. And he's going to remove the people out of the way. Daniel chapter 2 tells us God sets up kings and, and takes away kings. And he, and he does things based on how he needs things to go. That's the process he's doing. That's what Esther is trying to show us. I believe in my whole heart that Vashti does not represent 
uh, anything more than just the Gentile people as a whole. I don't think she represents Christianity. That's not what God's doing. She represents the Gentiles. And you've got to remember that the times of the Gentiles runs from around 400 B.C. up to the second advent. Now, not that God is, is bringing those Gentiles into any kind of favor. The only Gentiles he brings into favor are ones that choose to become Christians during the church age. But what he's doing is he's removing out of the way the Gentiles and the work that he's doing with the Gentiles. Because you've got to understand, even though the nation of Israel has the opportunity to come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ during the church age, Many of them will not, a large percentage, I'm talking probably in the 90 percentile, will not do that because they adhere to the Old Testament. They don't believe Jesus Christ was their Messiah. They don't believe he died on the cross for the sin of mankind. That's not what they believe. So many of them will not. But they, he, that opportunity is there. The main focus of the church period is on the Gentiles. That's why Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And the whole thing swings to them. What Esther's shown us is the Gentiles are going to fall out of favor. Therefore, the church is being moved out of the way. It, it, they kind of go hand in hand. And he brings the nation of Israel as a nation back into favor. That's what Esther pictures. So that's the prospect that we're going to take or the perspective we're going to take as we move into this. Now, let me give you some key points out of chapter 1 that, that would show you and I that it has to be dealing with the time we live in right now. One of those, two times, it talks about uh, the seventh day or having a seventh day, seven day feast. Well, we know from scripture that a day can represent a millennia. We are currently in the seventh millennia. I guess it depends on what calendar. You. If you're off the Jewish calendar, we're not quite to the seventh millennia yet, but if you're off the Gregorian calendar, and they're both wrong, both of them are, are off. I don't know how much they're off. Nobody really knows. There's guesses, and there's people that have different thoughts on it. Uh, we don't really know for sure. But regardless, we're, we're, right, we're at the end of the 6th millennia. We're in the 7th millennia. If, if time started in 4000 B.C., which we, I usually teach around here that Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 picks up around 4004. You say, how do you get that? Well, there's a gentleman uh, by the name of, uh, his last name's Usher, Archbishop Usher. I can't remember his full name. Uh, at some point, he sat down and he took the genealogies out of Scripture, and he took the, the date of 606 B.C., which we've talked about many times around here, which is the day that the, the bulk of the nation of Israel was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar at the end of Second Chronicles. He took that, that date fixed in history that many people believe and, and what can be rested on that date. And he took the genealogies out of Scripture and he worked backwards from 606 and he came up with 4004. So that's, the, that's been the general consensus, was the general consensus in most Christianity for a long time. So if you take 4004 and you put us in 2023, it's going to put you uh, up around, up in the 6,000s. We've had 6,000 years of history take place. We, we're, we're well over that. We're in the seventh day, or we're right near the seventh day. So we're at the end. That's what Esther's pictured. Uh, verse 10, es Esther 1.10, on the seventh day. There it is. Uh, you also get in here mentioned four times something to do with these days or the days. Um, in verse 1, it says, now it came to pass in the days. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, days will reference the tribulation period or the, the days leading up to the tribulation period. It also talks about the times. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, Paul tells us, I have no need, brethren, to write unto you of the times or the seasons. What's he talking about? He's talking about the end of the church age, the time leading into the church, leading into the tribulation. Uh, it also talks about those days. And in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ is talking about those days, which is the tribulation period. Uh, also, you have two seven-day feasts, as I, as I already mentioned. Well, you have two seven-day feasts in the seven feasts that God get, ordains to the nation of Israel. There, two of those feasts are seven days long, and we went over those Thursday night. One of them is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
One of them is the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, folks, the Feast of Unleavened Bread represents the first advent of Jesus Christ, and the second seventh-day feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, represents the second advent of Jesus Christ. So you have the entire church age covered through those two feasts, from the first advent to the second advent. Then you've got, it talks about all through the book, uh, virgins, fair young virgins. Well, in Matthew chapter 25, there's ten virgins. And that's a picture of the nation of Israel in the tribulation period itself. Uh, I'd also talk about virgins in Lamentations chapter 1 and 2, which is talking about the nation of Israel in the tribulation period. So, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six to seven different aspects of this book that tie right in with the end of the church age and moving it, just using the words and running them through scripture. The end of the church period right in to the, uh, the beginning of the tribulation period. Also to note, the word wrath is mentioned five times in the book of Esther. And what is the period of wrath in the Bible? Tribulation period. I mean, just there. I don't even. I'm not even listing them all out. I'm just giving you the obvious ones. We're dealing with the exact time we live in. That's what this whole book is about. And I want this morning. I got two two aspects I want to come to you in, and one of them I want to build a little bit more on what we talked about Thursday, and one of them I want to talk to you about the fact that now's not the time to be given in. I mean. Many of you are feeling it. You're feeling the spiritual heaviness that's coming upon. I don't think it's by accident. I don't think it's by coincidence. I don't think it's just the course of life. I think the spiritual intensity by which we are, are dealing with right now is, is becoming very great. Why? Because the devil knows his time is running short. And if you're paying attention to Scripture, I think you and I know that his time is running short. So, in that, we got to find the ability to continue to overcome. And it's not easy. You know, it's like a, how, how long does a boxing match go? 12 rounds? If you go the whole, anybody know? 12 rounds? That's what I thought. It's like a 12-round boxing match. Anybody ever watched an entire 12-round boxing match? I don't know if I have or not. I've watched, I've watched some, but I've, I've watched parts of the beginning of a boxing match. I've seen parts of the middle, and I've seen parts of the end. And then I've gone back and watched some of the old, you know, the old fighters, uh, Frazier and all those guys, and, and the ends of some of those matches that go 12 rounds. I mean, you watch those guys. They come out at the beginning, and they're just... Swinging, punching, they're dancing, they're moving, they're hopping. By the middle of the match, their faces are bloody, their eyes are swollen, their lips are swollen, they can't see real well. And by the end of that thing, they can't even hardly pick themselves up off the, off the stool in the corner to get back in to, to finish out the match. They're just exhausted. They've been physically beat and pounded. They probably can't even think straight. They probably see four of the other guy. I remember a guy one time uh, played playing in college football, and he he said he got hit in the head real good once, and probably had a concussion. But you know, 25 years ago they didn't have concussion protocol and do all the stuff they do now. They just said you're fine, get back out there. He was a kicker. How a kicker gets a concussion, I'm not sure, but and he had to go out and kick a field goal at one point later in the game, and. He went up to the coach and said, Coach, I don't know if I can do this. I, my head's spinning. I can't see right. I don't know. And he's like, well, what are you seeing? He said, well, I see three of everything I look at. He said, perfect. Kick it through the middle one. <clears throat> so you, you look at what, what it takes in these days to be a Christian. And I'm not saying, I mean, I wouldn't put myself up against those middle-aged Christians. Those Christians that were burned at the stake or tarred and feathered or had to watch their children or their spouse or their family go through it. I mean, I can't even imagine dealing with the things they had to deal with. But I can tell you as we get closer to the end of this thing, 
You've got to be prepared for everything. You don't know what this thing's going to bring. You know, our prayer as Christians, especially here in America, where we're pretty spoiled, is the rapture takes place before we get... What, what's the number one question everybody asks when you start talking about when the rapture is going to take place and when the tribulation is going to start? Yeah, and specifically, how much are we going to have to go through before... Right? Because none of us... I mean, I don't, I don't want to go through anything crazy. I don't want to have to deal with that. But you could see the spiritual battle that's impending currently most of you go out and you, you'll share your, your testimony with somebody or you'll try to share the gospel with somebody or you just try to give a, an encouraging or positive word to somebody and, and a lot of times what's the feedback you get yeah they groan at you, they laugh at you, they yell at you, they tell you they don't want to hear it They, I mean that's the state we live in there was a period of time and I, I would have loved to have seen it where it was harder to find somebody that didn't want to be one to Christ than that did. Now to find somebody that even wants to even remotely hear something positive, uh, it's, it's difficult. And you, and you mentioned Bible, or you mentioned the name Jesus, or you mentioned church, or you mentioned religion, or you mentioned anything that would have anything even remotely close, uh, you, you're cut off. And it's sad to say, it's hard to have a, a good, in-depth conversation about Jesus Christ with other Christians now. <clears throat> it's crazy. Yeah. No, you talk about the end times and raptures to some other Christians. I mean, we were having a real good conversation with a couple here about a month or two ago about, you know, just life and about church and things. And all of a sudden, somehow, rapture and and. Jesus Christ coming back got brought up, and you would have thought they just saw a ghost. And that conversation ended like that. So it, it's crazy. But let me give you some other, uh, let me give you some things that, that God showed me here. And again, that, that some of this stuff started coming to light last night. We know from Daniel, the book of Daniel, that, well, I'll ask you, who does Persia, in history represent well, that's that's where it's located but from a uh, from a from a prophetical standpoint you got the three beasts in the book of Daniel you've got the lion the bear and the leopard Persia is represented by the lion who does that represent in modern times thank you England Britain well folks look at uh, uh, verse, uh, what is it? Verse 3. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia. In Med uh, Medea. Media. Persia. England. You have a, a king in here, King Ahasuerus, and he reigns over Persia. And on top of that, uh, he has a royal party. Well, in modern times, what do you think of when you hear about the royal monarchy? It's the only one that still exists. It's England. So you've got Persia in here who represents England. You've got a king over Persia. And you've got a royal monarchy in here. And the current king, as I mentioned, is the eighth King Charles. And on top of that, he had an official coronation. I, I don't know if this is true or not. I don't, again, I said I don't pay attention. I never have. This is the first time I've really delved into anything that goes on with the royal monarchy because I think it was all it's all just a show anyway. But you start plugging in things in the Bible, and now I go, okay, maybe I need to pay a little bit more attention to that the history of it and how it plays. Now, I've known King Charles has not been tied to anything good since the 70s. He was at the very first meeting with Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum in 1971 when it started. I've known for a long time there's nothing good about that guy. But I guess I just didn't realize how deep it ran. Now, uh, you find out that King Charles is a Muslim. And one of his biggest things he wants to do 
in one of his big things, I, I mentioned he wrote a book called Harmony, or at least he was the main, I doubt he wrote it himself, but Harmony. He wants to bring nature and religion into harmony with each other. And the two biggest religions he wants to bring in harmony with each other, anybody want to take a guess? I mean, they call it Christians, but yeah, Catholics and Muslims. Chrislam. That's the religion of the of the tribulation, folks. That's the religion of the Antichrist. I can tell you right now, Chrislam. They may not be called by that name, but that is what they're trying to do. They're trying to uh, bring all faiths together with nature. He does he's very much tied into this? He's called the prophet right now. There's a very good possibility the 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 Pope and the Vatican will definitely have a major role in the tribulation period as well as Catholicism, as, and now you're seeing it all being brought together into one system. Yes, and King Charles is the king of the universe, of, of the Terra Carta and the, uh, what was the other, Astra Carta. King of nature and king of the universe. He believes he it is up to him to bring harmony to the to the universe and to the earth. Yes, correct. It's just now coming to light for for those that weren't paying attention. Some of those that were paying attention already knew that. Um. Now I will say this again. I do not believe he is the Antichrist. That is my personal opinion. What God what God began to show me last night is King Charles may line up with who King Ahasuerus is. And as we get farther into the book of Esther, you're going to find out that King Ahasuerus is not the Antichrist. But you know what King Ahasuerus does? He brings Haman, who is the picture of the Antichrist, in the book of Esther. He brings Haman from out of nowhere. Haman's not even mentioned in the first two chapters of the book. All of a sudden, in chapter 3, boom, Haman gets brought to be second in charge. He gets brought up over all the other men in Ahasuerus' monarchy and put second in charge under Ahasuerus. Out of nowhere. Well, you know from the Bible that the Antichrist will come from nowhere. He will be a man of low reputation and all of a sudden, boom, gets put on out of nowhere. I was going to tell you also with the nature thing, in Daniel chapter 11, the uh the Antichrist, you know where he gets his power from, where it talks about he gets his power from? Because he believes there is nobody above him. He believes there is no God. He believes he is God. And you know where he gets his power from? I don't remember what, what uh, verse it is in Daniel 11. You can go look. The God of forces. Well, hmm. Does that not sound like nature? Mother nature? The God of forces. All these things are starting to come together. Now here's where it gets even a little more interesting. I already told you on uh, on March 21st, he, he put in the agreement with Israel. Uh, if you go 180 days, well, there's a 180-day feast in chapter 1 of Esther with King Ahasuerus with all his men and women. 180 days from March 21st, it takes you to September 17th. I don't know if many of you remember what we were talking about here around September 17th of this year. We had the SDG Global Summit meeting that took place uh, here in New York at the UN Assembly. And around on September 17th was the day before the, the, the meeting was the 18th and 19th. And that was the meeting, folks, that they wanted to push forth their 17 uh, goals that incorporates the covenant with Israel and Britain that they want to enact on Tuesday. That was the meeting that they sat down and said, now is the time. We're not going to leave any man left behind. This is the final push. By 2030, all 17 of these goals will be enacted, and it will all be set in place. They don't call it this, but we know it as the Great Reset of the New World Order, or the Build Back Better. That took you to the eve of that meeting. 
And we know that, according to Daniel, there's 2,550 days of the tribulation period. And if you go 2,550 days from that meeting, it takes you to the end of the Jewish sixth month, which is right before the nation of Israel will leave Selah Petra, head back to Israel to reclaim the temple from the Antichrist. Now, coincidence? Absolutely possible. There's been a lot of times, there's been a lot of uh, great figures over the, over the millennia and over the centuries that people have thought were the Antichrist. Hitler was one of the great last ones. But boy, the Bible prophecy sure seems to be coming together. Things sure seems to be fit, fitting in right. And things sure seem to be lining up. Now, here's where it gets even crazier. And I haven't done any depth digging into this. And you guys, I'm going to do some this week, but you can look for yourself. There is a theory. Well, I shouldn't even say theory. There is a because some people believe it actually is true. That when King Charles was coronated on March 21st, or excuse me, May 6th, which by the way was eight days before Israel's um, 70, what are they, 76 now? 75, 75th birthday. That when he was crowned king, he wasn't just crowned king of Britain or the UK or of England. He's actually over 15 different countries. And you know what one of those countries is? Israel. I don't know that for a fact yet. I haven't done any digging. I'm taking a, somebody's word for it and I want to do some more research. But he was given authority to be the, the, the king over Israel. So you can see how there's a lot of people that are saying he's got to be the Antichrist. What I think he's doing is setting up and getting things prepared to give power to the Antichrist. Now, we've always talked in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the, the man of sin and the Antichrist, or the son of perdition, as it said there, the man of sin, son of perdition, is the same person. And it still might possibly be. But, maybe we didn't take into account that the man of sin is the one that actually gives the power to the son of perdition. Maybe they're two different figures. I don't know. Maybe King Charles is the man of sin that prepares the way for the Antichrist. I mean, wouldn't that make sense? Jesus Christ had a three and a half year ministry. Who came before Jesus Christ? John the Baptist that paved the way for the Messiah. Would it not, the Son of God, would it not make sense then? Maybe the Antichrist who has a three and a half year ministry would have a man come before him who would proclaim the way of the false Christ? Maybe it's so. Maybe who we're seeing right now is the preparation or the man of sin preparing the way for the Antichrist. So, that gives you a little something to gnaw on for the week. I'm looking forward to Tuesday. Now, what they're saying is we may not find out a lot on Tuesday because what I had, what's happening somewhere on Tuesday or Wednesday on the 13th, and Marla gave me some more insight that I want to go look into that I didn't know about. But, between the 12th and 13th, King Charles is pre-recording a Christmas message that's supposed to be delivered to the world on Christmas Eve night. I wonder what that's going to say. All right, send it my way. Keep me busy. <clears throat> I don't know if I want to say anything about... Nah, you can ask me later. I won't, t I won't preach it from the pulpit. <laughs> Good, I like to make a bag a little. How many of you ever watched X Files? I had never watched it. I don't even really know anything about it. But about three years ago, somebody gave me a few things from X Files that are really interesting. Very, very interesting with in light of everything that's taken place over the last four years. But the one I will focus on for the moment, by the way. There's information in there about what, what, yeah, anyway. The focus on at the minute is there's a scene in one of the episodes that they talk about how the secret government wants to take over the world and specifically the United States of America. And they lay out in there how they're going to do it. 
Now, you can look at that and say, well, that's absolutely crazy and insane until you start to look back at what has happened over the last four years in light of what was said. Now, I think that that show aired or that episode aired like 2018 or 17 it, or even older than that. 2012. I don't know. I don't even know when X-Files ran. I never even I'd heard of it, but I never even paid attention to it. Now, one of the interesting things that's done, that it's like a four-minute scene. There's a bunch of people in a, it looks like a living room of a home, and they're talking about this. One of the interesting aspects is they say that they're going to come first. What's going to kick it off for the normal people to see it is there's going to be a banking crisis. And they say it's going to happen on a Friday. You're gonna. They're gonna tell you that they're gonna. They're gonna mess. Uh, they're gonna have to make adjustments to the security of the banking system, and it's gonna take place on a Friday when nobody's paying attention. Then there's another. I I, I think it's a different scene. It's tied to it though. They say it's gonna happen on a holiday, when all the families are gathered together and nobody's watching what's going on. I've already told you before. You know the number one day of the year that they pass most legislation that has absolutely decimated this country? Christmas Eve night when nobody's paying attention. Go back and look at history. So then I start looking. 180 days prior to Pentecost in June, on June 12th, is December 15th, which is this coming Friday. 187 days was this last Friday, which if you add the 180 days plus the seven-day feast, it's 187 days. Then you look at uh, 180 days from King Charles' coronation. No, it was 180. I can't remember how I came to that date. I'll have to go back and look at my notes. It fell on December 22nd. 180 days fell on December 22nd. That's next Friday. A week from this coming, another Friday, leading into the holiday of Christmas. Hey, folks, hold on a second. Please don't misunderstand a word I'm saying. Absolute. I'm just trying to make sure that if, when it happens, not if, when it happens, you are prepared. They have been warning for three years now of a dark winter, if you've not been paying attention. I'm not saying this is the dark winter. All I'm saying, there's a lot of things funneling down. A speech is going to be given on December 24th by King Charles, who is claimed to be the king of the Jews right now, who matches up with a lot of prophecy tying into at least the man of sin. I just want you to be prepared. Spiritually, I could care less about the physical side of it. If the banking system goes, who cares? It's not our money anyway, and we're all going to be in the same boat. I'm not saying anything's going to happen with it. I just want you to have your mind wrapped around because now's not the time to give in now's the time to fortify yourself even more now's the time to look at it and say you know what fine if it happens I got this book and even if they take this book you should have the Word of God written on the tables of your heart Bruce you nailed it on Thursday night after we talked afterwards He was put in a position one time where he couldn't have this book in his hands. And you know what he did? He preached from what God had wrote on the table of his heart. That's what God needs out of us. Not to turn and run out of fear. Not to be worried. Not to be anxious. If you got Jesus Christ in you anyway, what do you got to fear? He already overcame hell and death. He's already overcome the world. Who cares? Now is not the time to give in. Now's the time to lock arms with one another. And you ever played Red Rover? Now's the time to Red Rover it. Red Rover, Red Rover, send it right over. We'll use the power of Christ in me and we'll take it down. Now's not the time to give in. Psalm chapter 1. <clears throat> I've said this before, but many times over the course of my life, I've looked back and said, all right, Lord, you know, I spent, from the time I was five, five years old, I played my first t-ball season. And I played sports from that moment. And, and before that, I mean, my dad was a high school basketball coach. I, 
I can't remember a time I wasn't in the gym at the high school. You know, I wasn't doing organized sports, but I was around sports my whole entire childhood. And before he was a basketball coach, he was a football coach at, at the high school level. I don't know how old I was, but I remember riding in the old Camaro with him to drop off film with the two old reels we were talking about Thursday. The film from the game the night before, I don't know, I, four? I don't know how old, three, four? My whole life, as far as I can remember back. And God gave me the opportunity to participate in athletics through, through my college years. So from, from five, at least in organized sports, to 2021 20, was the last season. Well, how many years is that? 17 years? No. 16 years? 16 years of my life. And so I look back sometimes and go, Lord, what, why, did, why did I devote so much time to it? And it wasn't just showing up in, you know, for, the, for the first practice. I mean, summer's in the weight room. Summer's running on the track. Summer getting conditioned. Winter's conditioning myself, lifting, running, you know, studying different philosophies of athletic. I mean, it wasn't just playing. There was all, it, was, it was a whole thing. And I've, I've shared with you before that I've, I've began to see God open my understanding over the last several years to, to why. It was for my mental state. It was for God to prepare me to be able to, to handle this and to handle the world. Because before you go out onto the field, what happens? You're in a locker room with all the other guys that are going to go out and battle with you. And you have somebody stand up in front of you and they, they give you a speech, and they, they, they yell at you, or they try to inspire you, and they try to get you fired up, so that by the time, no matter how nervous you were prior to, by the time you get to that point, you're so excited, you're so fired up, you want to run out and just, you know, tear the paint off the wall. I share that because sometimes I feel weird that I'm excited for everything that's getting ready to happen. I know that probably seems backwards because most people are going I don't want to face any of this and look I don't want to face anything tumultuous don't get me wrong I'll do whatever I have to do when the time comes no doubt about it I'm not looking forward to it but I kind of feel like I'm in that locker room before they they send us out to the field and say hey here it comes and I'm getting excited I'm ready to go to battle I guess probably mostly because I'm, I'm excited to go home and I know that my, my wife and my two girls are coming with me. And a lot of my great friends and, and, and family are coming with me. Now there's some left that I want to make sure that we got to get things right and, and we're squared away. But man, I'm ready to go home. Let's bring this battle on. Let's get this thing going. Now's not the time to turn and run away. Now's the time to, to lock arms with your brothers and sisters and walk up the path to the field. And you hear the, you know, we got, they used to play bagpipes for us in college as we walked to the field. It was the coolest thing ever. I'm ready to get those bagpipes going. I'm ready to, I, I, I think maybe right before the rapture happens, if God could just part the clouds for a second, you could start to hear the angels singing. Wouldn't that be so, just absolutely. He probably wouldn't do that because all of us Christians would just melt right there on the spot. Maybe you could at least start to hear the music. The preparations for the angels. You know, the angels are all seat, seated, around the, seated around the throne in preparation for, for us to come home. And when the music starts, that's going to be their cue to stand to get ready to sing. Maybe if we could just start the music. And we could hear the preparations for the rapture right before it takes place. Wouldn't that be a, just absolutely incredible? I didn't share the good side of, of, I'm not even going to get to the main message I had today. I didn't share the, 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 the good side of Esther in terms of what the fair, talks about the fair young virgin. Nine times in the book of Song of Solomon, talks about the fair virgin. You know who that is? That's you and I. That's the church. And in one of those times specifically, in Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 10, it's the call to the fair young virgin to come home. The church is in here too. 
It's a picture of God turning his attention to his virgin, the nation of Israel, and removing the fair young virgin for his son, Jesus Christ, the church. We're there. Maybe it's not this year. Maybe it's not this December. Maybe it's not uh, this, this uh, decade. I don't know. I'm going to still stay excited about it. Psalm chapter 1. Let's pray before we get into here. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I just thank you for the excitement that's in my heart. I look at the world and they get scared when they talk about the stock market crashing and, and the world turning upside down and the electricity going off. And I mean, heck, what a church service we would have. We're gonna, we work all year as Christians to have a candlelight service. We'll do it all year round if we have to. We'll bring the Word of God in here with candles and we'll sing and we'll praise God. Who cares if the rest of the world around us is in darkness? They already are anyway spiritually. It'll just show their spiritual uh, condition to an outward state, Lord. But God, I pray this morning as we get in here and we look at the, how we need to continue to strengthen ourselves and fortify ourselves. And, and no matter how many attacks, attacks the devil puts upon us, Lord, now is not the time to give in. Now is the time to turn towards you and to stand strong and to continue to, to polish the armor that you've given us. Lord, I just thank you so much for your love. I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on that cross. For six hours, he was in agony for me. And then he went down to the heart of the earth and wrestled the devil, overcame hell and death. And now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God, just patiently waiting on pins and needles for you to give him the command to go and to bring his bride. Lord, I love you so much. I thank you for this book. I pray now as we read it and study it that you just share with us the truth we need to see in it. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Psalm chapter 1. In verse 1 it says this, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Folks, what you have here in Psalm chapter 1, specifically verse 1, is the degression of a human being. And if you want to make it spiritual, it's the degression of a Christian. Because it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. The first thing the world will try to do, the first thing the devil will try to get, do, is to get you to get off the path that God has set for you and quit walking with him and walk with the world. The counsel of the ungodly. The first time you go to a human, to a man or a woman, to seek counsel for spiritual matters and for life's matters, rather than go and seek counsel from the Lord, the process has begun. You've got to be careful. Then look what happens. Once you go and walk with the ungodly, now you're standing in the way of sinners. Now you're standing with them. See, you walk with God, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, you decide that you're going to walk with this group. And before long, you stop, and now you're standing with them, and you're talking with them, and you're hanging out with them. And before long, you start talking like them. You start acting like them. You start looking like them. And then before long, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You sit down with them. You join in with them. You take part in what they're doing with them. It happens quick. It can. What I want to do this morning is show you how that happens and how you protect yourself from keeping it happening, to, from happening. Because, folks, what we can't afford right now as Christians is to get caught up in the seat of the scornful, to get caught up in the walking with the ungodly. Because the time is short. Four things. Because four is the number of testing in your Bible. Number one, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. These are the things that we as Christians have to be on lookout for. This is why in the Bible so often, specifically in the Old Testament, as we know that that's a picture of our spiritual battle, it talks about having towers and walls. you got to have somebody on those towers. What were those towers for? They were to look out over outside the city walls so you could see when the enemy was approaching. you got to be on the towers. 
you got to be looking around, your head on a swivel, so to speak. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And in verse 1 it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, that puts us right in the book of Esther, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. The number one thing, and I try to put these in order, which I believe that you will be attacked, or I, we will be attacked as Christians. Number one, seducing spirit, or spirits. Somebody's going to try to get you the wrong emotions. They're going to try to seduce you with the wrong spirit. You have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you if you're a Christian this morning. What the devil's going to try to do is seduce you to try to get you, even though that spirit can't leave you, you can choose not to serve that spirit. Remember, life is all about one thing in all actuality. You have a spirit once you're born. You can align your spirit with one of two other spirits, the Holy Spirit or the unholy spirit. And what you do is choose daily how you're going to align your spirit. You're either going to line it up with God's spirit or you're going to line it up with the Holy Spirit. You can't be in the middle. There is no middle. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. You're either going to love the one and hate the other. you got to pick. Choose this day whom you shall serve. You do it daily. So you're going to line your spirit up with the Holy Spirit or with the unholy spirit. And you will serve one of them. So the devil's going to try to come in, seduce your your spirit and he's going to try to give you the wrong emotion because that's what the Bible says he's going to give heed to seducing spirits in the latter times you want to depart from the faith give heed to seducing spirits number two go to Colossians chapter two Ah, uh, it's so subtle, folks. It's so subtle that it would be scary if you didn't have a Bible to pre-warn you. That's why the Bible is good for four things. Show you what's right. Show you what's wrong. Show you how to take what's wrong and make it right. And then show you how to take what's right and keep it right. First Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. No, 3.16, sorry. In Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. The second thing the devil's going to try to do is entice you with words. He's going to try to get you in the wrong mental state. See, he's going to get your emotion. You know why Christianity has been turned upside down the way it has? Because we left God's word and we started going on emotion. And when you get your emotions all out of whack then the words get all out of whack. So, he comes after your emotion first. Where is it in the book of Proverbs? It says, uh, somebody that can't control their spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Well, your spirit and your emotions are tied together. And if they break down your walls, you can't control what's inside. So they're going to come after you, try to mess with your emotion, and then they're going to get inside and mess with your words. Now, so many times in the Bible, God will use the same chapter and same verse in a different book to line things up. So he does that here. you got Colossians 2.4 here. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.4. This is Paul speaking. He says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. Hey, if any preacher ever gets up and tries to entice you with words, get out! They got a secondary agenda. They're trying to lure your spirit. They're trying to lure your emotion. That's why I don't come up here and try to flatter you with words. I just tell you what the Bible says. You can do with it what you want. Paul says, I didn't come to you with enticing words, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, capital S. That's the Holy Spirit of God. A whole different message here, but in John chapter 15, 16, 17, you get the work of the Holy Spirit of God. You know what the two aspects of the Holy Spirit of God is and how you can know instantly if you've got a counterfeit? One, it never comes speaking of its own. He always is glorifying the name of Jesus Christ. 
That's how you know. If you get a seducing spirit that shows up that is trying to glorify himself or turn you away from Jesus Christ or not glorify Jesus Christ, get away. Get thee behind me, Satan, instantly. Don't be seduced. Then he'll try to mess with your word. And then the third thing, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Folks, when they mess with your emotions and they start messing with the words, guess what? You start wanting to hear what you want to hear. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You start saying, I don't like that. I want to go over here where it feels better, where I can hear what I want to hear rather than hear what I need to hear. When they get your emotions wrong and they start giving you the wrong words, you start to like it. They give you the wrong feelings now. They don't, they don't feel good. They don't feel right. I think, I, I just feel like I need to, I just feel, who cares? I feel a lot of things. And I know you do too. But you know what you do with those feelings? You take them right to this. You know why people don't like to do that? Because you start reading you go, Oh darn, that's wrong. Oh man. Well, I guess I did that. Well, guess that thought's wrong. Well, shoot, this is... Start to point out what a sinner I really am. How lowly I really am. How despicable I really am. You, know, you got to play that song, John. We got to sing that song and close this thing out. The only thing that makes me right is because it's under the blood. Now look at that. Look at that. We just came full circle. Jesus Christ just got the glory. That's how the right spirit works. Don't feel bad. There it is. Don't feel bad. Don't, don't keep yourself down because we are despicable and all my works are as filthy rags. Don't stay down about that. Use that to say, Lord, you're right. I am filthy. I do need you. Thank you that you died for my sin, that I don't have to stay this way. That's what the crown of rejoicing is all about. It's about loving his appearing. You know why? One of the reasons I'm so excited for Jesus Christ to show up because I'm tired of being a filthy, low-down, rotten sinner. I'm tired of, dis of, of disappointing my father. I'm tired of making mistakes that bring shame to his name. I want to be pure and right before him. It makes me weary to be such a sinner. Then the last one in 1 Timothy chapter 4 again. Same verse we read, just kick it off. I'll read it again. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. And guess what it leads to? And doctrines of devils. Now your doctrine gets all messed up. Now you start looking at it going, well, shoot, maybe I can lose my salvation. Well, shoot, maybe this. Maybe I do have to work to get into heaven. Maybe I don't know. And all of a sudden, folks, it's, it's done. You get yourself all messed up. The devil claims victory over your, your mental state at that point. Hey, now is not the time. Get rid of it. Whatever you got to do. I like that song. You're all right. Tell him I said hello, though. <laughs> Whatever you got to do to make sure you don't get left hung out to dry. That's why it's so important that we continue to meet together. I, I was reading an argument over the last uh, week about you know people arguing that I don't need to be in church and you know, this and that. And they were using the, the uh, verse out of Hebrews chapter 10 that we use about uh, not forsaking the gathering together and all that stuff. 
And they're saying, see, it's not about being at church. It's just about being with your brothers and sisters. I couldn't agree more. It has nothing to do with being in this building. When the guys get together, it doesn't matter if we're at Frost or at the Andersons or Scott's or here. When the ladies get together, it doesn't matter if you're at, at Frost or wherever. It doesn't matter where you are. Where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. That's what gathering together is about. It's about strengthening each other. Fortifying ourselves together, locking arms and saying, ain't happening today, Lord. The devil's not going to have any power over me. <clears throat> Let me give you a couple verses to close out here. This is where we need doors to be able to shut. Leviticus chapter, uh, excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. In Psalm chapter 1, it talked about not being in the uh, counsel of the ungodly. In Jeremiah 23, verse 18, it says, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and hath perceived, and heard his word? Question. Who hath marked his word, and heard it? Question. Two questions. Hey, we got two choices. We can take the counsel of the world. Let me give you some of the, the options of the counsel of the world. One, there is no afterlife. Everything's here. Whatever's here is here. When you die, you go in the ground, it's it. Two, there's no hell. We're all working to get to the same place. It doesn't matter. You're going to end up in, in heaven anyway. Three, I don't know. Anybody got any others they want to throw in there? <clears throat> they're all wrong point being I've given you before some of the scientific and mathematic probabilities that this book would come together the way it has I'm not going to get into it this morning but you cannot be serious you cannot seriously look in the mirror and look at everything that has transpired over the last 6,000 years that was all already foretold and look and say none of this is real I think the book of Proverbs says it right. You're a fool. Now look at Proverbs chapter 19 in verse 21. Going the wrong way. Two questions were posed in Jeremiah 23. Then in Proverbs 19, 21 it says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. When the unsaved world gets to the great white throne judgment at the end of this whole thing, he will give all his reasons and all her reasons of all the counsel, all the psychologists and all the college professors with their masters and their doctorates and all the degrees and everything that their parents told them and everything that grandma and grampy and, and auntie and uncle and all the counsel of the world, my best friend and my whatever. And you know what's going to stand at the end? God's counsel. Because he's going to cut out the feet from underneath those people. And he's going to say, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, for I never knew you. That's it. And then the last one in Psalm chapter 33. In verse 11. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Just as the Bible promised that his words are forever. And the thoughts of his heart to all generations. If you want the only thing that's eternal, take the words of this book, which is Jesus Christ in a book form. And put them in you. Two more verses. Second Timothy chapter one. After all, we were promised that Jesus Christ would come in book form. 
2 Timothy chapter 1. He said, Lo, I come in the volume of a book. It is written of me. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 17. He says, But when he... <clears throat> That's... Am I in the right one? That's the one I want. Maybe it was 1 Timothy chapter 1. Sorry. No, I don't know what I was doing there. Last verse. Ephesians chapter 6. Sometimes I just start writing stuff and I don't even know what I'm writing. Well, I say sometimes. It's really a lot of times. Last promise of the day for you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, my brother, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Oh, I know what I was getting after in that verse. I wrote down the wrong one. But God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sound mind. How do you get that? Through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Then, Ephesians 6, that you stay strong in the power of his might. That's the only power that's going to keep us and preserve us. And prevent us from falling in. Regardless of what happens next week, next month, next year, you've always got this promise that Jesus Christ fights every single battle for you and I. All we have to do is stay in fellowship with Him and allow Him to continue to lead the way. And when the attacks come, fend them off. Call somebody. Pray with somebody. Read some scripture. Don't allow the devil to seduce your mind because that's what he's trying to do. Because he knows if he gets your mind, he gets your body. If he gets your body, it turns into a nightmare. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. We thank you so much for eternal life. Father, we thank you for giving us the, uh, the prophecies that tell us how it's all going to go down. We don't fully understand how it's all going to put together, Lord, but I think we start to see a lot of pieces come together. Now, if we didn't have a book that explained to us how it was all going to end, I could see how we would be quite... Uh, quite disturbed but Lord because we already know because you told us 2,000 years ago how it was all going to end we can look at it and say well we've been expecting this we didn't know when but we've been waiting and Lord in waiting we were just preparing ourselves and now that the time is here the battle is getting ready to wait, rage we can step forward and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have given us everything that we need. We do not have to live in fear. We do not have to live in anxiety. We do not have to live in worry and in wonder. We can prepare ourselves and we can be rest assured that you have already won this war. We're just waiting for that last trumpet to blow. God, my prayer this morning is that we would continue to stay fervent in the word, that we would continue to stay fervent in prayer, and that, God, we would stay fervent in fellowship with you and with one another. God, we thank you for everything you do for us. We love you so much. And we thank you for the shed blood on Calvary's cross that leads us straight to you. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.